Hi, and welcome to the Governance, Law, and Economics Lecture Series. My name is Derek Yonai, and I'm the director of the Koch Center for Leadership and Ethics at Emporia State University. The Governance, Law, and Economics Lecture Series is designed to highlight the three institutions that must work together to support and defend a free civil society. Those institutions are good governance, the rule of law, and market-based institutions. For those of you who are familiar with our GLE lecture series, this year we're going to do things just a little bit differently. We're going to record a half-hour lecture from our guest speaker, and then a week after we launch it, we will be having a live Q&A session with them from 6 to 6.30. And we'll have a link for that so you can join us at the end of the video. So again, we're doing things a little bit differently to be able to socially distance and still be able to provide wonderful content for those of you out there. Dr. Matt Zielinski is a professor of philosophy at the University of San Diego. He specializes in political philosophy and applied ethics. He is a director of USD's Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy, the director of USD's undergraduate minor in philosophy, politics, and economics, and the co-director of USD's Institute for Law and Philosophy. He is the editor of Arguing About Political Philosophy and is currently writing or editing four books. Professor Zielinski's research deals with the intersection of ethics, law, and economics with two specific areas of focus. The first involves a proper understanding and the normative status of liberty and political libertarianism. The second is the phenomenon of exploitation and its implications for individual ethics and political institutions. Professor Zielinski has recently been exploring the compatibility between libertarianism and a basic income guarantee. His work on this topic has been discussed on CNN, The New York Times, The London Telegraph, and elsewhere. Today, Professor Zielinski discusses why a universal basic income isn't as crazy as you think. So here's an idea that sounds kind of crazy. What if we had the federal government give every American citizen a sizable chunk of money every month without checking to see whether they needed it, without asking them to work for it, without asking them if they were even working at all or even trying to find a job? To a lot of people, that sounds nuts. But that, in essence, is what a universal basic income is. And that is the idea that I'm going to try to defend for you today. Not only am I going to try to defend it, uh, but I'm going to try to defend it from an ideological perspective that is broadly libertarian or classical liberal. If you're like a lot of people, a universal basic income probably sounds like a pretty socialist sounding idea. But I want to be arguing that there's a good case to be made for it, even from the perspective of someone who's strongly attracted to the ideas of free markets, personal responsibility, and limited government. But before I can do that, we need to talk about what a basic income is. And that, unfortunately, is something about which there exists a great deal of confusion. A large part of the confusion stems from the fact that the phrase universal basic income, or as I'll call it from this point out, UBI, doesn't actually identify any single well-defined policy. Rather, the term is used in a fairly loose and imprecise way to refer to a family of policies, all of which have two features in common. First is that they involve cash payments rather than in-kind transfers of the sort that we find with food stamps or Medicaid here in the United States. And second, those payments are universal or unconditional, at least in the sense that they're not dependent upon recipients being employed or even actively seeking employment. Beyond those two narrow points of agreement, there is a lot of variation among basic income plans. <clears throat> so some plans say that the money should go to households, while others say that the payment should go to individuals. Uh, some say that it should go only to adults, while other plans say that at least some money should be given to children as well. Some envision a UBI program that would be added on top of other currently existing welfare programs, while others see the UBI as partly replacing or consolidating those programs. And then, of course, there's the big variable, which is how large the UBI should be. Just how much cash are we proposing to give people? And should the size of that grant vary with factors like geographical cost of living or other demographic variables? So you can imagine there are a lot of very different UBI proposals out there, which differ pretty significantly from each other, depending on how they answer those questions. 
And some of those plans, and this is something I really want to emphasize, some of those plans would be absolutely terrible. <laughs> uh, some versions of the UBI would be much too expensive. Some would really undermine people's incentive to work. Uh, and largely a result of those two problems, some versions of the UBI would result in what I think would be an kind of economic catastrophe uh, that would ultimately make us all, including the poor, much worse off. And yet, while there are some versions of the UBI that would be an utter disaster, what I want to convince you of today is that there's nothing at all objectionable in the basic idea of a UBI as such. The UBI is a program with a long and respectable pedigree in political thought, and it is, I want to suggest, an idea whose time may have finally come. One of the earliest statements of the idea comes from Thomas Paine, one of the founding fathers of the United States, in a fascinating little pamphlet called Agrarian Justice, which he published in 1797. And in that pamphlet, Paine argues, for reasons that we'll explore a little later on in this talk, that every American citizen should be given a lump sum payment upon reaching adulthood, and then in a policy that kind of anticipates modern social security programs, a smaller recurring annual payment once they reach age 50. In the 20th century, the UBI gained a number of adherents, including Dr. Martin Luther King, who in the 1967 book, Where Do We Go From Here, endorsed the basic income as what he thought was the simplest and most effective means of abolishing poverty. The idea even found some support among certain libertarian economists, including the Nobel Prize winner Friedrich Hayek, who endorsed the idea of what he called a minimum income for everyone in this passage from his 1973 book, Law, Legislation, and Liberty. Though actually you can find the idea even as earliest and most popular book, The Road to Serfdom, which was published way back in 1944. So this is something that Hayek endorsed throughout his long career. Now, there are about as many different arguments for a UBI as there are different versions of a UBI to argue for. And while I'm happy to talk about some of those arguments with you in the question period, I can't possibly cover them all here. Nevertheless, there are two broad categories into which those arguments tend to fall. The first are what we can call efficiency-based arguments. And the basic idea here is pretty straightforward. It goes like this. If we're gonna distribute income, then we should try to do in a way that maximizes benefits relative to costs. And that simple idea has two implications. First is in general, we should try to at least redistribute some money from rich to poor because via the phenomenon of diminishing marginal utility, dollars are worth more to the poor than they are to the rich. And second, at least a good chunk of the redistribution in which we engage should take the form of cash. Why? Well, because cash provides more of a benefit to the poor than do in-kind transfers. The idea is that people know their own needs better than government does, and cash gives people the freedom to use the benefit in whatever way they wish, whether it's paying their rent, buying groceries, paying their cell phone bill, or even just saving for the future. So the first set of arguments are based in economic considerations of efficiency. Second category of argument consists, in contrast, consists of more philosophical appeals to the idea of justice. Now, there are a lot of disagreements among philosophers about what exactly justice is or requires of us. And so there's a good deal of variation among these arguments. And here I'm just going to draw attention to two, uh, one of which harkens back to that pamphlet by Thomas Paine that I mentioned earlier. So Paine's argument was based on the idea that the natural resources of the earth are the common property of humanity. Here he's following the English philosopher, John Locke, who had argued just a century ago that God gave the earth to mankind in common. But, Payne's argument continues, because we've allowed most of the earth's land to be claimed as private property, he thought we owed some compensation to those who have been deprived of their birthright. And that he saw it was precisely the role of a universal basic income. Now that argument is very, very similar to another argument that would be advanced later in the 19th century by Henry George in his enormously influential book, Progress and Poverty. And George's idea was that since the natural resources aren't produced by anybody's labor, nobody has any natural right to the value of those resources, and thus nobody's rights are valued if the value of those resources is taxed, even at a rate of 100%. George thought this, what he called the single tax, uh, could be used to fund the legitimate functions of government. Uh, and though he never explicitly advocated that it be used to fund a, a UBI, a lot of George's later followers have seen the UBI as a kind of natural extension of George's theory. So that's one kind of justice-based argument. 
A different sort of argument can be found, at least implicitly, in the writings of Friedrich Hayek. And as we saw earlier, Hayek advocates the idea of a minimum income for everyone, but he never exactly said why he favors a minimum income for everyone. Nevertheless, uh, as I've argued elsewhere, I think one plausible explanation for Hayek's support of a UBI can be found in his theories of freedom and coercion. So Hayek, like a lot of classical liberal theorists, sees the protection of individual freedom as one of the main functions of government. But Hayek understood freedom in a fairly distinctive way. So for Hayek, freedom is a state in which one is not subject to what he called the arbitrary will of others. And that understanding of freedom, Hayek thought, and I think he's right here, supports some pretty libertarian conclusions about the need to constrain government powers that were not subject to the arbitrary will of bureaucrats or legislatures. But it's not just government that is a threat to your freedom as Hayek understands it. And so I think there's a good grounds on this freedom, on this conception of freedom for support for UBI as well. And if it's not just government that's a threat to your freedom, if poverty is a threat to your freedom as well, if being poor means that you, for instance, have to take whatever job is available, that you can't say no to your employer, and that therefore you're at the mercy of your boss, your landlord, your husband, then you're not truly independent. You're not truly free. A UBI, by giving individuals some cash resources to fall back on, thereby gives them the power to say no to others and thus helps to assure each person at least some measure of independence and freedom. So those I think are two of the most promising libertarian or classical liberal arguments for a UBI. And like I said, I'm happy to talk with you more about those arguments or other completely different arguments in the discussion if you'd like. But before I move on to talk about what exactly I think a UBI should look like in the details, I wanna make one more argument for UBI. And it's an argument which, unlike the previous two, doesn't depend on any fancy philosophical or economic reasoning at all. Uh, what I wanna to suggest to you is that signing on to the UBI simply requires that you agree with three simple propositions, none of which are in the least bit radical or utopian. So here's the first of them. The first proposition is one we've already encountered is that some redistribution should take the form of cash payment. Second proposition is that some redistribution should go to help the unemployed rather than just the employed as do current policies like for instance, the earned income tax credit or the minimum wage laws, right? These are benefits that only help people who already have a job. And the third proposition finally is that some redistribution should help the unemployed even if they cannot demonstrate that they are not able to work. Okay, so we've already seen the argument for the first of these three propositions. So I wanna stress again that the argument I'm making now only depends on the claim that some redistribution should take the form of cash. Maybe you think that government should ensure that people receive, I don't know, adequate medical care and that a cash grant that people could spend on whatever they wanted wouldn't be an adequate substitute for that. Fine. All I'm saying is that in addition to that and whatever other in-kind transfers you think we ought to make, we ought to give people at least some benefits in cash. Second proposition is new, but I think quite straightforward. Uh, if we're going to redistribute income, it makes sense that we should prioritize redistributing it to the people who need it most. And of course, all else being equal, people who are unemployed, who don't have any job at all, need help more than those who have a job. So there's something a little bit perverse about redistribution schemes like the earned income tax credit that deliberately exclude the unemployed. Third proposition, the last one here, th and this is the one where people run into problems with the UBI, because uh, a lot of people think that it makes sense for the government to help people who are genuinely unable to work. But they think, surely we shouldn't give me money to people who are able but just unwilling to work. That actually was uh, Friedrich Hayek's view. So while I think there's a good Hayekian case to be made for a universal basic income, the minimum income that Hayek himself advocated wasn't strictly speaking universal because he thought that only people who are um, either working and unable to provide for themselves adequately or unable and, and thereby kind of barred from the labor market from working 
only those people should be given this government assistance. So a lot of people are gonna take issue with this third proposition if they're gonna take issue with anything. But I think the third proposition is defensible. Um, even though there's this natural temptation, I think, to discriminate between what are often called the deserving and the undeserving poor, uh, the poor who deserve our help and the poor who don't deserve our help. Nevertheless, I think uh, there are three good reasons to resist that temptation to discriminate in that way and to adopt this third proposition instead. First is this accurately discriminating between unwillingness to work and inability to work is difficult. And it requires information that government agencies often simply don't have and which they can't get without serious invasions of personal privacy. How's the government gonna know whether your inability to get a job is due to your being lazy or whether it's due to you not having skills or whether it's due to you having some physical incapacity in some way? Are they going to spy on you at your home, right, to see if you can walk around, if you're just faking it when you show up at the office? These kinds of issues are a real problem. And it's not just a theoretical problem. In the United States, audits of SSA disability determinations find that between 20 and 60 percent of disability benefit rejections are false negatives. In other words, the government's often mistakenly denying benefits to people who actually deserve them. So the government's likely to make mistakes in making this distinction, which leads to our second point, which is that depending on your view of distributive justice, it might very well be worse to wrongly deny aid to someone who deserves it than it would be to wrongly give aid to someone who doesn't deserve it. You might think, in other words, that false negatives are worse, morally speaking, than false positives. If so, then even if you accept in theory that there is some distinction between the deserving and undeserving poor, you might see the UBI as justifiable simply as a way of erring on the side of caution. Finally, last point in support of the proposition, my argument so far has implicitly been assuming that everyone who's able to work should be working. But that just isn't true. At least not if we understand work in the usual narrow way it's understood by economists, that is, as participation in the paid labor market. Sometimes it's better. It's better for individuals, it's better for society, that individuals don't work. It's a good thing for parents to spend some time at home with their young children. It's a good thing for young people to spend time investing in their human capital by staying in school another year, rather than entering the labor market right away. So if we really want government to discriminate between the deserving and the undeserving poor, it's actually even more complicated than just distinguishing between those who can work and those who can't. It's a matter of discriminating between those who can and should work and those who can't work or can work but shouldn't work. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I'm not terribly convinced the government can pull off that kind of discrimination in any reasonably accurate way. All right, if you put these three propositions together, and if you accept all three, cash transfers, paid to the unemployed as well as to the employed, and paid without an effort to distinguish between the unable and the unwilling unemployed, then you've got yourself a universal basic income. Now, as I said, there's a lot of variation between UBI plans, some of which are great, some of which are terrible. And the difference between the great and the terrible is all in how they flesh out the skeleton formed by those three propositions. How big should the UBI be? How do we pay for it? And who exactly is going to be eligible for it? So to put a little bit of meat on those bones, I'm now going to turn to a model of what I think a reasonable UBI might look like. I'm going to move through this pretty fast, but for those of you who want more details, you can find them in a paper referenced at the bottom of the next slide, which I'm using as a source, actually, for a lot of the numbers that are to follow. Now, before I begin, I want to note that my model that I'm going to give you here is just that. It's a model. My goal is to adopt, uh, convince you that we should adopt some form of UBI, not necessarily that we should adopt this particular model of UBI. The purpose of the model is just to give you some idea of what a reasonable UBI might look like. But if you think that some of the details in that model need tweaking, then by all means, tweak away. So here, in short, is the model I want to lay out for you. $500 payment every month made to every citizen or permanent resident of the United States, regardless of age, 
regardless of income, of assets, geographical location, and the payments are, logistically speaking, to be distributed through the social security system on a biweekly basis. So let's take each of those facets of the plan uh, in turn, starting with the big one, starting with the size of the UBI. $500 a month, that isn't a lot of money, but since it's given on an individual basis, it does provide some extra help for families who can pool their UBIs together and pay for fixed costs like mortgage and utilities. And it provides a special level of help for families with children, since after all the families with children will get the $500 UBI for the kids as well as for the parents. $500 per month also happens to correspond with the US Census Bureau's definition for deep poverty for a single individual. And so it's an amount that can make a serious difference in alleviating, uh, if not poverty altogether, at least some of the worst features of poverty. There have been studies of even smaller cash transfers uh, among Cherokee families and among residents of Alaska with the Alaska Permanent Dividend Fund. Uh, and these studies have found significant positive effects uh, on a number of variables, including the frequency of low birth weight babies, uh, on the reduction in crime, on educational achievement. So $500, even if it's not enough to live comfortably on, uh, it's an amount that can make a real difference in the quality of people's lives. So in the United States, there are about 313 million people who would be eligible for this transfer, which generates a total cost of about $1.8 trillion, uh, which is equal to 10% of US GDP. That is a significant amount of money. But uh, it is worth noting that even if the US simply added the UBI on top of existing current spending, which to be clear is not what I'm gonna ultimately advocate that we do, but even if we just added this on top of everything else we already spend, that would actually still put the US at a lower level of spending as a percent of GDP than countries like Sweden, Norway, and Canada. Right now, the US is spending about 38% of, G, uh, of um, GDP as compared to 49% of Norway and 50% for Sweden. Canada is at 44%, uh, so we would actually be a little bit above Canada if we add this in, but not if we follow the plan that I'm gonna lay out to you uh, in just a moment here. So just to put this in perspective, it's a lot of money, um, but uh, it's not as much as some other reasonably prosperous and successful economies are spending in their social welfare programs. So how else could we pay for it then uh, if we didn't just add it on top of existing spending? Well, I think a lot of the cost of a UBI can and probably should be paid for by consolidating and replacing other existing cash and in-kind transfer programs. So for instance, if we were to place SNAP, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, uh, TANF, Temporary Aid for Needy Families, Unemployment Insurance, Section 8 Housing, the Earned Income Tax Credit, and the Child Tax Credit, all of which are various transfer programs within the United States right now, that would save us about $353 billion per year, which is a substantial amount of savings. Further savings could be achieved, at least in theory, by consolidating social security programs, including old age survivors and disability insurance and supplemental security income. Now, I wanna stress, this is something that would be extremely difficult to pull off politically. Uh, social security is for good reason known as the third rail of American politics, meaning that if you touch it, your political career is dead. Um, but uh, I think there are good independent reasons for reducing or eliminating what is largely a regressive system of redistribution, one that gives to, you know, takes from current workers who are at a relatively low level of wealth and gives to older Americans who are generally at a higher level of wealth and replacing it with a more progressive universal basic income scheme. And if we were to do so, um, if we were to find some way to pull that off, that would free up just over $1 trillion additional dollars. Uh, which would leave the remaining funding gap of just under 500 billion to be covered by taxes. So the program isn't free, uh, but it's not exactly breaking the bank either, especially when we consider that that significant portion of those taxes, whatever funding gap we have left over, whether it's 500 billion if we cut social security or more if we don't, um, a significant portion of those taxes would just be recollecting money that we're distributing through the basic income program, right? So it's not an additional cost on top of what you're already playing. 
Uh, by the way, side note, I'm sure somebody want there wants to ask me about why I think we should give people to wealthy money to wealthy people just to tax it back again, rather than means test the payments on the front end, um, as you would do in, say, a Milton Friedman style negative income tax. I'm happy to talk more about that with you in the discussion period, but the short answer is I don't think there's much of a practical difference between those two approaches. So um, we could talk about more about that later. So to start wrapping up, let me talk about what I see as some of the main benefits of a UBI as compared to the present system of, of taxes and transfers. First benefit, I think, is that a UBI would give us a simpler, more transparent, and more general system of redistribution. It cuts down on government bureaucracy, and for reasons articulated by both James Buchanan and Friedrich Hayek, I think it gives us a system that's more consistent with the rule of law and harder to rig in favor of special interests. The more general the benefit is, the less of a special interest there is that has an incentive to manipulate that benefit to their own uh, advantage at the expense of the rest of society. So I think the generality, the universality of the basic income is actually a really a point in its advantage from what you might call a public choice perspective. Second main advantage, I think, is that a UBI gives the poor real freedom. And when I say that, it gives them freedom. I'm not, I'm not using that word in any kind of obscure Hegelian sort of way. I mean, just it gives them ability to live their lives as they see fit without coercive interference by others, to say no to an abusive husband or an overbearing boss, or for that matter, to a paternalistic government bureaucrat. And finally, as we've seen, a UBI of just $500 a month could nearly eliminate deep poverty, even if not all poverty altogether, in the United States. Fourth, and finally, partly by eliminating deep poverty, a UBI could generate substantial long-term benefits in health, education, crime prevention, and long-term savings that, on expenses that you would have otherwise had to make in dealing with those problems later. Uh, you can find some, isn't it, again, this is not just a theoretical point, you can find some evidence of this if you look at some of the basic income experiments that have been run both in the United States and Canada, again, these are things that uh, I'd love to talk about with you more. Can't go into the talk, but if you want to talk about them in QA, I'd be happy to do so. But there was a great experiment in Canada in the 1970s called the MinCom experiment, which demonstrates some really amazing um, health and educational benefits of a, of a relatively modest uh, and short term basic income program. So those are some of the benefits of uh, what the UBI would do. Uh, but I also think it's kind of important to be clear on what a UBI wouldn't do, what a UBI isn't, right? Um, so first of all, look, a UBI isn't socialism, right? No one here is advocating nationalizing the means of production, abolishing private property, or even giving up on capitalism, right? A UBI is, it's a welfare state program. And it's not only compatible with, but in my view, actually supportive of an economic system of free trade, free markets, and the kind of creative destruction and wealth generation that goes along with that system, right? Um, markets generate disruption in the process of creating great, great wealth. And that disruption can cause real problems for people in the short run, even if in the long run, it's to all of our advantage. One of the main attractions of a UBI, as I see it, is as providing a kind of social insurance system to help people cope with those disruptions uh, and to bear with the system that's generating these massive benefits in the long run. So the UBI is not socialist, but not only is it not socialist, it's not even egalitarian. Uh, the point of a UBI isn't to create an equal distribution of wealth. Uh, it's not to make sure that everybody has the same amount of money. It's to make sure that everybody has enough in some sense. It's, to use the language of philosophers here, it's, it's a sufficientarian proposal, it's an ugly word, but it's a sufficientarian proposal, not an egalitarian proposal. Uh, and that, on my view, is just a much more defensible position on both philosophical and economic grounds. Uh, third, the UBI, as I envision it anyways, isn't a substitute for work. Um, a goal, a UBI of $500 a month uh, isn't going to be enough for most people to live on in perpetuity. So the goal here is to supplement earned income, not to substitute for it. Uh, it's to make it easier for people to take time off to care for a child or to make ends meet when they're laid off until they can find another job. Um, so if you're worried about, you know, the robot apocalypse, right, and there's not going to be any more jobs for anybody else because robots are going to be doing everything, um, 
that I don't think is the main reason to support a UBI. I mean, I think those those kinds of concerns are overblown, anyways. Um, but you don't you don't need to appeal to those kinds of concerns to justify a UBI. Um, the UBI is justifiable on much more prosaic grounds um, that are quite compatible with the assumption that most people are and will continue to work for a living uh, to support themselves. Finally, last point, and this is just, I guess, reiterating what's kind of my main point of my talk here. There's nothing inherently radical about a UBI. The case I've set out doesn't rely on any far out economic or philosophical theories. The only premises it assumes are ones I think that are fairly widely shared, uh, that the government ought to do something to relieve extreme poverty, uh, and that in doing so, it ought to favor an approach that is most compatible with individual freedom and with economic efficiency. And that, I hope I've convinced you by now, is a universal basic income.